again we have as our text a verse that I hope we're becoming familiar with and one that has tremendous potential in helping us if we'll really open up and receive what God has for us. And this is Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10a. You got it, John? Proverbs 9, verse 10. In the first part of the verse, let's stand together and let's read it aloud. All right, let's read. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's read it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Thank you. Be seated. About a month and a half ago, for the first time in my life, I heard the first sermon that I've ever heard on the fear of the Lord. I preached the sermon. Since then, I've preached four, three other sermons uh, relative to the fear of the Lord. It has been such a blessing to my heart and a confirmation of the Word of God and what God is doing in my life and what He wants to do in other people's lives that I joyfully prepare these messages and I joyfully share them with you. Now, when people are being fed, there's no need to worry about them becoming weary by staying on a particular subject. We're dealing with these, trying to give many biblical illustrations on Sunday evening especially, focusing on winners of illustration, trying to illustrate the biblical truths that we present with Bible and with other appropriate illustrations. Now, the first message on the fear of the Lord looked at the fear uh, as it related to the character and nature of God. When we think of important personages in history and how they have wielded great power, usually in an ungodly way, because power does corrupt people, then we compare their mischief oftentimes, their mischief and their power, with a God who created this whole universe. That was the first focus. The fear. The fear of God. And we noticed that the Bible uses in the Scripture the word fear to represent God. He is called the fear of eyes. That's amazing. In the next message, we dealt with the Word of God, the Bible, as the fear of God. Since in God, in His nature and character and His Word, there is no contradistinction between who God is and what He says. With human beings, there's often a big difference between who we are and what we say. But with God, there's no sharp contrast. His Word is an extension of Himself totally trustworthy, totally true. And in Psalm 19, where it gives a list of synonyms for the Bible, it's called the commandments of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the law of the Lord. And in that seven or eight designations of the Bible, lo and behold, we find the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. How many times have I read that? Through the years, I've memorized that passage. And it never dawned on me that that passage is calling the Bible the fear of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? And there are many other passages we dealt with. Then the next Sunday night, we tried to present a message on the fact that there is an ungodly fear of God. And this ungodly fear of God should be avoided and should be eschewed by wise people. Uh, there is an awful fear of God that consumes the sinner who is being brought to repentance. A fear of bondage which is produced by the Holy Spirit of God. But when a person is saved, then that spirit of bondage is taken off of the repentance sinner as Christ comes in. And this godly fear moves in. So... The ungodly fear, which is born of a rebellious heart. 
but not godly fear. So there is all the difference in the world between ungodly fear of God and the proper fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And then last Sunday night, we dealt with the question, what is godly fear? And we just tried to take the Scripture and look at it from about uh, 10 or 12 different angles, giving a biblical description uh, a presentation, a picture, a biblical picture of what godly fear is. Now tonight, I want us to try to look at where does this godly fear come from? It is right. It is to be received. It is to be followed. But how do we get it? Where does it come from? And so that's what we're looking at tonight. And may the Lord bless us as we pursue this for a little bit tonight. This amazing, godly fear of God is produced by God Himself, much like in the Scripture in the book of Ephesians. It says, For by grace are you saved, what? Through faith. And what? And that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, you see. Well, now, what's the gift of God? Certainly salvation is. But many have come to recognize that even the faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, even that faith itself is a gift of God. So that we can't go around boast and say, well, I, I have faith, so I'm great, and that's why God saved me, because I had faith. Well, you did, but even God gave you that faith as you responded to the wooing of His Spirit. Well, now here, out of the uh, love of God his elect, for His elect, out of His love for His elect, we receive the fear. He says in his word, I will be their God and I will put my fear in their hearts. You see, so unsaved people are not going to receive this kind of godly fear since it is a gift of God and does come from the love of God. And listen again to the Lord. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, saith God that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts. You see, and they shall not depart from me. Who's he talking about? He's talking about his elect, people that are saved. God, because of his love, not his hatred. You see, because of his love, he puts this kind of fear in his people's hearts. Then the fear comes out of a new heart that is given by God. It is, not, it is not a natural thing. People can have the fear of devils in their heart, a natural thing, and an ungodly fear of God. But uh, this fear that God gives can only come from a new heart that God has given. The Scripture says, A new heart also will I give them. And then again he says, A heart to fear me. Isn't that amazing? So until a man receives a new heart by way of the new birth, you see, a new will, a new life by way of the new birth, then he cannot have this godly fear that originates in the heart of God. It would be like Jesus said, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles from a corrupt heart that cannot proceed this proper fear of God? so as to believe God and to love God. Uh, the Bible says, Jeremiah said, the heart, by nature, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We wonder, how can criminals do this? How can politicians do this? How can some of the people that you know, how can they do the things that they do? And sometimes you look into your own heart and say, how can I think the things I think? think? How can I do the things I do? even among saved people. What about the unregenerate? The heart is deceitful, you see. So the unregenerate heart cannot have the proper fear of God. It comes from a new heart that God gives when people are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then it flows also from our response to the Word of God, you see. Uh, listen to the Scripture. Gather the people together, men, women, and children, and the stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God, you see. Now, uh, if a person uh, drinks in the Word of God, that person is going to be give a, given a proportion amount 
of the fear of God in his soul. If he drinks much in, he's going to have much of the proper kind of fear in his heart to God. If he drinks in little, then he's going to fear little. If he drinks in the word of God not at all, he is not going to have the fear of God in his heart as he ought. Uh, this teaches us that how to judge people is, is this, uh, as it relates to this fear is this way. Those that stand in awe of the word of God and drink from it, from it are going to be heavy into this fear of God. But uh, those who are rebellious and who are unsaved and unregenerate and have no time for the word of God but rather despise it, they will not have the fear of God in their hearts, not the proper biblical kind of fear. Now, this godly fear comes also from faith, and these spiritual graces are linked together just like uh, unsaved people in their sin and evil. Their sin and evils are joined together. They, If they do one, they'll usually do another, and it'll lead to another, just like bad links on a chain. But spiritually, in a Christian perspective, it works similarly, you see. And the, the same God who produces the faith also produces the fear. I listen to the scripture. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. You see, God spoke. Noah feared what God said he was going to do because it was a terrible disaster that God told him he was going to do, you see. And he did what God said. He was moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. That's in Hebrews chapter 11. And so the fear of God in his heart made him to prepare against unseen dangers and that he might be inheritor of unseen happiness. And isn't that the way God works? Now where people do not have this faith in the word of God, they're not going to have the kind of fear of God that enables them to see the dangers and would lead them, if they should obey God, into unseen happiness. Now, this godly fear also flows from a repentant heart. Until individuals truly with godly sorrow turn from sin, there can be no reception of this godly fear. Paul, in dealing with the Corinthian church, he was very upset over the sins in the church among Christians. He wrote them a very harsh letter, the second Corinthian letter, very harsh. Then he heard, he received word that they had received the letter, that they had repented of their sins, and this is what he wrote to them. For behold, this selfsame thing that she sorrowed after a godly sorrow, sort. That's what repentance is. You sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. God producing in his people what he desires to produce, you see, because of repentance. And then it flows from a sense of the love and kindness of God as he operates in our life, recognizing how good the Lord is. And in direct proportion to our truly, <coughs> humbly recognizing God's manifold blessings in our life, we have produced by God the right kind of fear towards him and towards his operations and towards his work. David said, if, <coughs> pardon me, if thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, O Lord, who should stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. And again, nothing can lay a stronger obligation upon the heart to fear God than a sense of, of hope in his mercy, according to the book of Jeremiah. And then again, the fear, this fear of God flows, it originates from a due consideration of the judgments of God. David had an amazing experience one day when he was trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Karjath-Jerim uh, 
where it had been during the reign of King Saul. He wanted to bring it to Jerusalem where it had become the political capital of the nation. He wanted it now to become the religious capital, religious capital of the nation. He assembled some 30,000 men. They, you know the ark, this holy box that had uh, the tables with the Ten Commandments on them that God wrote with his finger on these tables of stone. It had uh, a pot of manna in it. It had Aaron's rod that budded. For some reason, God chose to use this ark uh, to represent his special presence. And it had uh, almost a magical quality about it. It's amazing. I've often thought, I've never yearned to go to the Holy Land because I'd hate to go and see some Muslim mosque built on some Christian holy place. I think it'd make me want to regurgitate. I say that nicely. I've never wanted to, I never just yearned to me, Louisiana, the swamps in Louisiana is the Holy Land. But really, I believe if I could be convinced in my mind that they had actually discovered the Ark of the Covenant, if it was anywhere in the world, in Israel, anywhere else, I'd try to catch the next plane over there to see it. The Ark of the Covenant, I don't think it'll ever be found because it so easily would become an object of worship. And God never intended it to, to be that. But nevertheless, David wanted this ark in Jerusalem so that Jerusalem would be the spiritual and religious capital as well as the political capital. So he took these 30,000 men, had a great parade. Uh, the men had a, a, an idea. Some of, the, some of them had an idea about how to convey this ark from uh, Hijrath Jerim to Jerusalem. So they got a nice new cart and ox and so forth. And this is not at all what God had told them. He said, when you move this ark, you use some long sticks and staves and you put them through the rings that are prepared for it and you carry this thing. And uh, the Levites were responsible, the priests and the Levites were responsible. Well, they, somebody had the bright idea, let's put them on a new cart, we can do it quicker, we can get the job done. And in the course of transporting this ark, it looked like the cart was fixing to tumble and Uzzah reached out his hand to stop it from falling on the ground and God struck him dead. Now, it never did seem right to me that God should do that. But God didn't ask my opinion about it. Well, you know what? It didn't seem right to David either. David was angry with God. And he said, I'm not taking this ark to Jerusalem. If you do that, and I'm just giving my explanation as best I can about how David reacted because he stopped transporting the ark right there and left it in Philistia at Gath at at the house of Obed-Eden. And for the next three months, that ark stayed right there, and David watched how God blessed the house and everything Obed-Eden had. God just poured out blessings on her. He said, listen, I'm going to have to have that ark. So he, he went on and he got it. But now here's what David said in the light of that experience. He said, my flesh trembleth for fear of thee. And what are we talking about? We're talking about view sane, sensible considerations of the judgments of God. Whether you understand them or not, when a person, a sensible, sane Christian, considers the judgments of God, it, it produces the right kind. Listen, you know some of the worst offenders of the Word of God are pastors and deacons and deacons' wives. You know why? Because pastors and deacons and deacons' wives, they get so familiar with church and the preacher and the Bible, that they get to where they feel like they can just reach out and catch that ark anytime they want to to keep it from falling. And unless pastors and deacons and their wives realize our susceptibility to do the same type of thing that Uzzah did, we'll lose our fear of God and we'll, we'll get the big head. And God will just withdraw his blessings and we really won't know why he does it unless we recognize our susceptibility to not consider the judgments of God then we'll lose this precious blessing, the fear of God that helps us to realize, hey, this matter of being saved and called to preach and called to be a pastor and called to be a deacon and called to be a deacon's wife, this is such a high and a holy privilege I must never tamper with it as though I owned it, as though it was my right. God couldn't get along in his church and kingdom without me, that kind of an attitude. 
Somebody say amen here because you know it's the truth. Thank you, Belinda. <laughs> All right. Um, again, listen to the Scripture. God commanded false prophets to be stoned. That's rough, isn't it? Why did he do it? Here's what he says, that all Israel might hear and fear, considering his judgment, you see. Again, listen to this. How many sons do we have here today? Hold your hand. All you sons, hold your hand up if you're a son. Okay, listen to what the Lord said. You can put your hand down. Any rebellious son is to be stoned to death. Now, that's in Old Testament times. Aren't you glad you're not living in Old Testament times? <laughs> yes. But now notice why. Here's why. That all Israel might hear and fear. I don't think you had too many rebellious sons when they were doing the Word of God. You see. Um, now, listen to this. How many people here tonight have ever told a lie? Hold your hand up. Okay, some of you sleep or lie right now. Okay, listen to what the Bible says. A false witness is to be executed. That's a liar. Is to be executed. Man, that's rough. Why? That all Israel might hear and fear. What's he talking about? This right kind of fear is coming in part from a due consideration of the righteous government of God. Now, once again, we don't have to understand it to respect it. We know that God understands it and we trust it. Now, again, this godly fear flows from remembering how God has delivered us from our former distresses. Was there ever a time in your life when you realized that you were lost and on your way to hell? If there was ever a time in your life that you realized you were lost and on your way to hell, and that how wonderfully on the basis of your childlike repentance and faith Jesus saved you, and you just stop and think about that. It's so easy to forget how awful it was to be under conviction. It's so easy to forget the awful terror of believing, according to Scripture, that we were lost and on our way to hell. But when we remember that and realize how Jesus delivered us, then God produces this godly fear in our soul that causes us to love Him and to be responsive to Him. Now here's the Scripture. God says, Take heed and keep thy soul diligent, lest thou forget the things that thine eyes have seen, and lest thou depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and to thy son's son. What things was he talking about? The things that they saw at Horeb when the law was given. Namely, the fire, the smoke, the darkness, the earthquake, their first awakenings by the law of God by which they were brought into a bondage of fear. You see, the law won't save you but it can be used by the Spirit to bring the bondage of fear that brings you to a state of repentance so that you can be saved. Now, notice what the Scripture says. The day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord thy God said unto thee, Gather me the people together, and I will make them to hear thy words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth. So they're remembering what God did to deliver them. And God in the process is producing this godly fear. Isn't that wonderful? That's why we ask you to give a testimony. Tell something good God is doing in your life, you see. And even though we don't always point out, don't usually point it out, God, as we're doing this, is producing this holy awe and reverence for who he is, what he's doing, and what he's going to do. Now, answered prayer is another way that God produces this godly fear in our hearts. The scripture says, If there be in the land famine, pestilence, blasting, mildews, locusts, caterpillars, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all the people of Israel, which shall know every man the plague in his own heart, and spread forth his hands towards this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, 
and do and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the heart of all the children of men, that they may fear thee all the days of their life, that they may live in the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. Oh boy, answered prayer. I wonder how often God has done a mighty thing in our life and we realize that when that prayer is answered, God is doing so much more than just the prayer that we thought that we wanted to come. And then again, uh, a conviction of the omniscience of God. An absolute conviction that God is seeing what you're thinking. An absolute conviction that God is knows what you're doing. Now, wasn't Jonah silly? to try to flee from the presence of the Lord. I mean, he knew that God was his, his God was the God of the sea as well as the land. But yet in his rebellious state, his spiritual awareness was dimmed, and here he was trying to do something God wouldn't see. We need very much to be aware of God's knowledge that he sees you. He sees every thought. I know some people that think that you can't pray a prayer of faith if you don't speak it with your words. It's one of the most popular theologies in America today. You've got to say with your word, the word of faith, you see, in order for it to become reality. You've got to speak it aloud. Oh, no, they teach this with great conviction. And I guess people that are born without a capacity to speak can't be saved and can't have this kind of thing, you see. I don't know. It's amazing how people seem to be so dogmatic and they, they leave God. Listen. God knows your heart. Now, speaking, if you speak the right thing, can be a blessing. But God knows your heart before you say anything. And it courses through your mind. God knows it. And that conviction is the difference between, um, for a Christian, between growing in the fear of the Lord and not. Jesus said this about the Pharisees and the hypocrites. You are they that justify themselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. And so for want of this conviction, men go into such secret sins, and they do not have the fear of God that they need and God wants them to have. And then the fact that God judges impartially in the New Testament, the book of uh, Peter, 1 Peter, and give unto every man according to his works and our ways that they may fear before thee. It's in the New Testament too, folks. And so you can see what a weighty grace this is, the fear of the Lord, and some of the elements mentioned in the Scripture, scripture from which it emanates and are originates. The love of God, the... Um, the special uh, electing love of God to his chosen children. It originates from the, his heart. It comes from a new heart that God gives to people that are saved. It comes right out of the Word of God as we respond joyfully and drink from the Word of God. It's directly connected to the kind of faith in God and in his Word that the Lord produces as we say yes to his Holy Spirit comes when we repent of sin as Christians, uh, when we fall away and backslide and we repent, God sends this. It comes from a sense of the love uh, and kindness of God to the soul. We consider with gratitude how good the Lord has been to us. It comes as we consider his judgments upon us and upon others and upon ourselves. It comes as we remember the former distresses and how God brought us out of them. It comes as a result of answered prayer. It comes by our knowing that God is keenly aware of everything that we are and think and do. It comes as we consider the impartial judgment of God. And uh, for these and other reasons, we know that the fear of the Lord is indeed the beginning of wisdom. Brother Glenn, what is our hand tonight?